Okay. So good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, my name is Dr. Abby Soya Kintamain, or Abby, everyone calls me Abby. I am an um, internal medical trainee at, in Southeast London, and I have a special interest in gastroenterology, hence I'm doing this um, teaching today. So for everyone who's not been here before, we're just gonna do some single best answers um, just about inflammatory bowel disease. And what will happen is I'm gonna go through the question, you'll get a chance to answer, um, and then I'll tell you what the right answer is, and then I'll explain why it's the right answer. You get opportunities to ask questions as well um, throughout the session, so please feel free to ask questions. Okay. So question one. We've got a 22-year-old female presents to the GP with a six-week history of bloody diarrhea, crampy abdominal pain, fecal urgency, and tenesmus. Her observations are in normal range, and clinical examination reveals an aftos mouth ulcer, abdominal tenderness in the left lower quadrant. She's referred urgently to gastroenterology. Her fecal calprotectin is 320, normal is less than 150. Sigmoidoscopy Sigmoidoscopy subsequently shows continuous inflamed bleeding mucosa extending distally from the rectum to the sigmoid colon. Which of the following is a risk factor for the most likely diagnosis? Oh, you went to the answer, Emily. <laughs> oh, well, guys. Um, <laughs> so current smoker, previous appendicectomy, first degree relative with ulcerative colitis, diet containing gluten and obesity. Um, I assume you've all seen the right answer, but let's just do the poll for 10 seconds in case anyone hasn't seen the right answer, and then I'll go through the question. Uh, are you guys able to vote? Because it says I can't. Yeah, Emily, it says you, it says um, apparently they have to complete all the questions in one go and it doesn't let you submit, unfortunately. Okay, guys, I'm so sorry. Um, is there anything, can we make a poll at the moment now? Is it too late, Emily? Um, let me just try. If not, we can just put the answers in the chat and then just carry on, it's fine. Thanks so much for your patience, guys. But you can have a quick read of the question anyway and just really, really go through it and get the salient points while we wait. Um, well, how about we go through the first one and then we can do it for the next one. So I think so. the, the right answer is, um, as you all saw, is C. And I guess the most important part of, can we go to the next slide, uh, Emily? Thank you. So it says, so the question is, which of the following is a risk factor for the most likely diagnosis? I don't know if you all got, got the right answer, but the most important thing first is to get what the right diagnosis is. So it's a young woman with a six week history of bloody diarrhea. So that's really key because if it's six weeks, it rules out that it's an infection because you shouldn't really get infective gastroenteritis um, for more than about a week or so. So at least you know it's not that. She's also got bloody diarrhea. And that's really important when you're thinking about IBD because you get obviously with IBD, it's either Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. By the way, if I'm explaining anything I don't understand, please um, just put a question in the chat box. But yeah, so the main thing is, okay, you've got six weeks, it's not infective. So it's probably chronic, it's probably inflammatory. Then you go, is it bloody? If it's bloody, it's more likely to be ulcerative colitis, okay? So that's why, um, so you're thinking ulcerative colitis. So then you continue reading on. Her obs are normal. She's got aftos ulcers. Now aftos ulcers is tricky because it's more likely seen in Crohn's disease, but you can also get it in ulcerative colitis, okay? Then um, you see fecal carprotectin. So fecal carprotectin is a protein um, that we normally use to measure inflammation in the gut, okay? So it's a protein that's produced when there's an inflammation and it's usually used to one, say, there's an inflammation, it's not IBS, for example, 
And then two, we tend to like measure people's fecal calprotectin over time, and it tells us whether or not they're actually um, responding to treatment. So if fecal calprotectin is high, so it's telling me she's got an inflammation, then the most important part is her sigmoidoscopy shows that she's got continuous inflamed bleeding mucosa from the rectum to the sigmoid. So the big thing about ulcerative colitis versus Crohn's is that ulcerative colitis is continuous, okay? So Crohn's, you get patchy inflammation in the colon, but ulcerative colitis is always continuous. So you'll never get, you know, inflammation in the sigmoid and then nothing in um, the transverse colon and then in the um, right side of the colon. It's always continuous, okay? So when they do a scope or colonoscopy, it should show inflammation throughout not just in little areas. Okay, so that's the key part. So once you've looked at the question, you know it's ulcerative colitis, then you look at which risk factors are more likely to give you the diagnosis. Current smoker, actually that's more Crohn's. Appendicectomy, also Crohn's. So these things you just have to know, and um, there's no, you just have to learn them. Diet containing gluten, that's more um, celiac obviously, and then obesity isn't a risk factor. Okay, can we go to the next slide? So um, IBD, I, I hope everyone actually knows what IBD is. I feel like I've just said talking about it without actually explaining it, but it's in the name. It's an inflammation of your colon. And I didn't really understand it until I went into the hospital because unless you know someone who's had it, it's kind of an odd concept, but basically your colon just gets inflamed. Um, and we think it's due to like every, like most inflammatory disease an abnormal immune response to antigens um, it's dis dysregulation. So you get, you know, increased T cells, cytokines and inflammation. It's likely to happen in someone who's already genetically suscept susceptible, which is why you're getting family history as well. And there's probably an environmental trigger. We're not sure what it is exactly. They think, they think it's probably the microbes in the gut and the specific microbes that some people have that's more likely to trigger your IBD. Okay, so this is generally for IBD, um, UC or Crohn's. Okay, next. So these, again, this is something you just have to learn. Um, so family history in both UC and Crohn's. This is key, non-smoker in UC, you're more likely to get UC. You're less likely to get it in a smoker. Classic exam question. So just try and remember that one. Um, no appendicectomy and appendicectomy in Crohn's and then NSAIDs in both of them. And then having infectious gastroenteritis also increases your risk of Crohn's. So this slide is just about learning off. Okay, next one. Okay, so um, while I read the question, if you wouldn't mind um, setting up a poll, Emily, that would be amazing. Um, so question two, we've got a 25 year old female who presents to her GP, five week history, five week history of passing four bloody loose stools per day, tenesmus and waking up during the night to open her bowels. She also reports left lower abdominal pain and fatigue, no past medical history. She's an ex smoker. Uh, our obs are in normal range. Examination shows she's got some abdominal tenderness in the left lower quadrant, no distension or garden. Um, there's no evidence of perianal disease. Um, serum total IgA and Ig TTG antibody are negative. Fecal calprotectin is 280, and she's referred to gastroenterology. So, which of the following findings on histology would confirm the most likely diagnosis? So you figure out what the diagnosis is, and then you need to figure out what histology would confirm the diagnosis. So A is inflammation extending from the mucosa to serosa, B, granulomas, C, goblet cells, D, villous atrophy and crypt hyperplasia, and E, crypt abscesses. So we'll just give you a minute to read it all and figure out an answer. Okay, so 
everyone's picked, well, most people have picked A, 45% of you. Some of you have picked C, some of you have picked D, and some of you have picked E. So it's kind of actually, okay, this is really useful, actually. Fine, Do, should we go to the next slide and see what the right answer is? Okay, so the answer is E. Um, it's really interesting. So a lot of you have picked A. So I guess, let, let's go through the question. So she's 25, she's female. Five-week history, so we know it's not infection. Four bloody loose stools, so bloody, likely UC. Um, no past medical history. Ex-smoker, tricky, but she's only 25, so maybe the smoking history doesn't matter really in this case. Um, ITA and TTG is negative, and that indicates that she probably doesn't have celiac disease. That's what that's trying to tell you, because TTG is negative in, um, is positive, sorry, with celiac disease. But fecal carbotectin is high, so that's telling you that she's got some inflammation. It's not telling you it's IBD, but she's got some inflammation in her bowel. Okay, so some of you picked inflammation extending from demucosa to serosa. So if you remember from physiology or anatomy, I can't remember which one teaches you, but the layers of the colon, it's um, mucosa, submucosa, then the muscular layer, and then serosa. So the most likely diagnosis, first off, is actually UC, and that's because she's got the bloody stools. Um, she's got the, um, well, to be honest, it's just really the bloody stools that it, that, um, that's telling you that you see less likely to be Crohn's. And it's a really key thing because you just don't really see Crohn's patients having a lot of bloody stools and for her to have four is quite a lot. So it's more you see, I know the ex smoker thing is a bit tricky, but she's 25. So it doesn't really provide a true history, but again, I'm sure you can get some smokers who also have UC. So she's got UC um, and that's why it rules out A. So UC is only inflammation in the mucosa. Crohn's is inflammation from the mucosa true to all the layers down to the serosa. Okay. Um, then with B, you get granulomas in Crohn's, not in UC. Um, in C, you get, so goblet cells are the cells that um, around in the colon that tend to produce mucin or which is kind of like the mucus like substance that helps the mucosa be to prevent friction. And because of all the inflammation that you get in UC, actually what you find is a depleted amount of goblet cells. So when you find goblet cells on histology, it's not gonna tell you anything and it's definitely not gonna tell you to UC. Then D is villous atrophy and crypt hyperplasia. That's classic for celiac disease, which they've told you she doesn't have. And then E, crypt abscesses, again, it's just classic for UC. And basically it's the epithelial cells um, kind of line up like this um, in the bowel, if you remember, kind of like that. And the crypt is just there in the middle. And when you get a lot of inflammation, you get a lot of neutrophils and you kind of get crypt abscesses, which is kind of like, I guess, like pus in those crypts. So that's kind of how you remember crypt abscesses and it's very, very classic for UC. Okay, hope that made sense. Again, ask questions, please. Okay, so this is um, just going through the symptoms that you get with UC. So you get bloody diarrhea, classic, classic, classic bloody diarrhea, um, fecal urgency and incontinence, nocturnal defecation is actually classic. I think she had it. So that's when, so when you see a patient with IBD, you always ask them, do you wake up? Or do, you pa uh, do you wake up in the night to open your bowels? It's very classic for UC. Um, and it tells you how severe it is actually. If you wake up at night, then it's quite severe usually. Um, tenesmus. Um, abdominal discomfort, usually the left lower quadrant. Right lower quadrant is usually more Crohn's, left lower quadrant usually more UC, but that's because it usually affects the sigmoid and the rectum. Um, Pre-defecation pain relieved on the passage of stool, weight loss, faltering growth, fatigue, malaise, anorexia, and fever if it's quite severe as well. Um, some signs you see in UC clubbing, which is also seen in Crohn's, those aphthous ulcers that we talked about that you get in the mouth, abdominal distension, tenderness, and a mass in the left lower quadrant. So this picture is just telling you that UC can happen in different parts of the colon, but remember it's always continuous. So if it starts in the rectum, it's never just gonna um, end up in the cecum, okay? It has to be continuous, okay? Unlike Crohn's. Okay, next. So when you've got a patient with ulcerative colitis, um, these are the blood tests that you would do. A full blood count, um, because you wanna make sure that all the bloody stools hasn't caused them to become anemic. You do a CRP and ESR. I'm gonna explain why you do an ESR just in a few slides ahead, but it's obviously a measure of inflammation. Using ease and renal function is useful for anyone who's got diarrhea, just to make sure they haven't become dehydrated. 
um, and they don't lose a lot of their electrolytes through um, opening their bowels. Liver function tests are important in ulcerative colitis because it's another question coming up, so I won't say it, but I'll tell you why. Um, thyroid function tests are important because any patient with diarrhea should um, have thyroid function tests because having hyperthyroidism can cause diarrhea as well. Um, you do ferritin B12 folate to vitamin D just because obviously it's kind of, all the inflammation in your colon can create a malabsorptive state and you're not absorbing as well. So it's always important to um, check all your vitamins as well. Um, celiac serology is important to anyone with diarrhea just to make sure it's not actually all celiac disease. You do a stool sample. Microscopy and culture is important because it could all be an infection, although with a six with history, as I said, it's less likely. But obviously, there's some parasites and things like that can be that can be a bit more persistent. Fecal cow protecting, like I mentioned, is very important, um, particularly to see how they do over the long term. So then you usually do investigations to actually visualize the um, colon itself. Like you can see in this picture, you can see all this patchy inflammation. And so initially to do a sigmoidoscopy, particularly if you come into the hospital, because, because it's so fragile and inflamed, um, we actually just do a sigmoidoscopy at that moment because you don't really want to just um, go all the way through the colon when it's so fragile you just don't want to cause a perforation for example but what you will see like I mentioned is a continuous inflammation distally from the rectum it doesn't go beyond the ileocecal valve which is classic and in comparison to Crohn's where you can get small bowel disease um, pseudopolyps you can get sometimes under loss of austral markings that you get on colon on, um, in your colon on x-ray um, you can also see that on the sigmoidoscopy. Um, the inflammation is confined to the mucosa and submucosa, and you can get crypt abscesses, like we talked about, which is what the histology is showing, and depleted goblet cells, which is why the answer was not goblet cells. Um, you can do an abdominal x ray, that's important because with inflammation of the bowel, you can start to get a lot of, because the bowel doesn't move as well, um, you lose your peristalsis, and you're more likely to get a dilated bowel that can actually perforate which is why you do an erect chest x-ray, because when you do an erect chest x-ray, you can look for a pneumoperitoneum or air on the diaphragm, okay? And a CT scan is also useful. It helps you to, one, see the inflammation, but also make sure there's nothing else that's actually happening. And actually, today, we had a patient who came in with diarrhea, and um, he had a CT scan, and it turns out it was cancer. So sometimes it can be really useful to just make sure it's nothing else. Okay, next. Okay, question three. We've got a 32 year old man presents to his GP with a flare up of his ulcerative colitis. Okay, so you know what you see. He reports passing seven bloody stools a day with nocturnal defecation, left lower abdominal pain. His regular medications include mesalazine and paracetamol. On examination, he's tender with a palpable mass in the left lower quadrant. Which of the following examinations or investigation findings? in addition to stool frequency, would indicate that this was a severe flare of ulcerative colitis. A, a pulse of 85, B, a temperature of 38.5, C, ESR of 27, D, albumin of 30, and E, a hemoglobin of 140. So I'll just give you a minute. Okay, so majority of you have chosen B, a temperature of 38.5. Some of you have chosen ESR of 27 and D, albumin of 30. Okay, great. Let's see what the right answer is. The right answer is temperature of 38.5. Okay, so 
they've told us this patient's got severe flare up of ulcerative colitis. And the question is, well, no, they haven't said it. They said, what would tell you he's got a severe flare of ulcerative colitis? The answer is actually in the next page. Um, so if we could flick over to the next page, that would be really useful. Okay, so there's a criteria to actually tell you this. It's, there's not, it's not clinical, well, it's, it's a mixture of clinical and objective measurements. Um, so basically this is the true love and width severity index. You just need to know it. Um, they ask it all the time and we do use it clinically. So if a patient presents to a &E, you need to figure out whether or not it's mild, moderate or severe because it, has, it helps you to decide what your medical uh, treatment will be. So mild, so it depends on the amount of stools you're getting a day, the amount of blood you're getting a day. So every time you see the patient on the ward run, you ask them, how much is it? How much are you getting now? Is it better or worse? And you actually can ask them to just document it um, on your phone so that when you see them each day, they can tell you how much uh, they're getting and it helps you to tell whether or not it's still it's getting better or not um it depends on anemia the temperature and um ESR on pulse so if we look at the severe side of the table on the right side so six plus stools a day visible blood and stool and one feature of this four which is where the answer came from so you notice that the temperature of 37.8 was the answer a lot of you chose ESR you were close but it has to be over 30 and that was why um it wasn't correct but people who chose low albumin, because albumin of 30 is low. Um, so you do get low albumin in severe UC. It's just not part of the criteria, but you actually do get it. And you usually see um, patients who have illnesses or inflammation with a low albumin. It's quite classical for um, a critically unwell patient, um, but it's not part of the criteria. So you just kind of have to learn the criteria um, to get that question right. That was it really. Um, there's a pediatric index as well, which is called the pediatric um, ulcerative colitis activity index, um, which they do use as well. Okay. Um, yeah, we can go to the next slide. So question four, you've got a 36 year old man who presents to his GP with an acute flare up of his UC or ulcerative colitis. He reports passing four loose stools a day with small amounts of blood. He's been taking mesalazine suppositories and oral tablets daily for four weeks with no improvement in his symptoms. On examination, he's apyrexial. He's got a heart rate of 75. His blood pressure is 125 over 86. His abdomen is mildly tender in the left lower quadrant with no distension, guarding, or rebound tenderness. Blood test results are shown below, and a recent colonoscopy has shown a continuous inflammation confined to the rectum. His hemoglobin is 156, which is normal. His ESR is 10, um, which isn't normal, but it's not very high. And his CRP is 12, which is just slightly raised. So what is the most appropriate next step in managing this patient who is on mesalazine? So do you A, continue his mesalazine for a further two weeks and review? Do you add oral PRED? Do you add oral isothyroprine? Do you admit for IV hydrocortisone or do you admit for IV cyclosporine? So we'll just give you another minute to answer and then we'll go through the answer. Okay, so most of you have chosen oral prednisolone, okay, and some of you have chosen A, C, and D in equal proportion, and no one's chosen E. Okay, cool. So let's see what the right answer is. So the right answer is oral prednisolone. So I guess the most important thing is one, you need to figure out where exactly on the scale of um, how severe his ulcerative colitis is. Um, so he's definitely not acutely um, severe. He doesn't have, he's not tachycardic. He doesn't have um, any pyrexia. His ESR isn't that raised. So we can safely say he doesn't need to come to the hospital. Okay. So if we go to the next, well, yes. So A, 
um, is not correct simply because he needs something. We've already tried four weeks of the missiles and it's not improved, so that's not correct. Um, C is not the right option because, well, B is the right option. And that's just because um, the man there is a specific management pathway that we have for patients with UC. Okay, so if we go to the next page. Um, so he's got mild to moderate UC, as we can see from the fact that he's only had four stool, um, four bloody stools per day. Um, and again, he didn't have any of the uh, signs of severe colitis. So we know that, so we can move away from that. So when you're thinking about UC management or IBD management, there are two types of ways to think about it. First thing is you're, you want to induce remission, right? So once you've induced remission, that means you've stopped your symptoms, then you maintain remission, okay? And so that's how you, so they come in with issues, you give them something to stop the symptoms, stop the bloody diarrhea, but then you need something to maintain that remission. So for patients with, when you're thinking about UC, okay, it depends on how severe the UC is on the index and how severe it is actually on colonoscopy. So when they say proctitis and proctosigmoiditis, that means the inflammation is in the rectum, which is proctitis, and then proctosigmoiditis means it's in the rectum and the sigmoid. So that's what that means. And then if it's more extensive, um, then there's a whole different um, treatment. It's not that much more different, to be honest, but it also depends on, so it tells you that it depends on how the index is and actually how severe is it is. So when patients with UC come to the hospital, it will usually tell you what kind of UC they have. So you'll say, UC diagnosed in 2012, left-sided colitis seen on an on colonoscopy. Classic, okay? So usually we start with, if it's proctitis, it's topical aminos, aminosalicylate or ASA as we call it. Topical means it's just a suppository. So literally you give them a suppository and it's topically gonna cover the rectum, okay? Then you can, next stage is topical and then oral, okay? And then if it's still not working, then you go to oral and then oral steroids. So this gentleman was at three. I don't know, you can't actually see my mouse, but he was at number three because he was ready on ASA and it wasn't working. So we'd give him steroids. If he wasn't responding to steroid or steroid refractory, then we have other options. So you could try azathioprine, which was the next option. Um, and then if he was still refractory, you can try something called um, a biologic. I don't know if a lot of you know what a biologic is. I'm not sure what year you guys are, but um, they are the next step for patients with steroid refractory disease, or sometimes the first step actually, but we'll talk about severe colitis later. Um, so once you've treated him with the oral steroids and, he's, and you check each day and you find out that he's now opening his bowels once a day, you know he's improved. Um, you wean off the steroids um, and then you switch him back to a medication that should maintain remission. And that will also depend on, again, what kind of colitis he has. Because it would make no sense to give someone topical ASA, which is a suppository, when they've got um, extensive colitis elsewhere. You'd want to give them something oral because then it can work that way and that way, if that makes sense, or the colon. Um, the reason, I guess, we don't like to give steroids um, as a maintenance um, drug, as you may know, is that it's got ridiculous amounts of uh, side effects. So we don't like to keep patients at all on steroids. So they should be switched and swapped onto um, another type of medication, okay? And at the bottom, it just says, um, every patient we UC should have a colonoscopy um, every six to 10 years after diagnosis. And that's simply because they're, they have an increased risk of colorectal cancer. Um, so you have to check them. And it's very important actually, because it does happen, okay? So we can go to the next slide. So patients who come in with severe colitis are very different. So the mild to moderate, you can kind of manage them in the community with a GP or they can call and let you know how they're doing. But when they've got severe colitis, they need to come to the hospital because they need IV steroids. So they come in hospital, you think they've got severe colitis, boom, IV steroids. Um, sometimes we give them antibiotics if we think it's an infection. We don't really do it often, but we do, uh, but we can. Uh, we give them IV fluids, it's important, um, because they, they're opening valves like 10 times a day. You just need to replenish them. You get a dietitian to see them, um, obviously, because when the bowel is that inflamed, you're just not absorbing nutrients at all. Um, you give them VT prophylaxis, which just means a uh, venous thromboembolism prophylaxis. It just means that they're more likely to um, have clots simply because they've just got a lot of inflammation in their body. It just 
increases your risk of clotting. So we usually give them um, VTE. And that usually worries people because it seems a bit strange to give someone um, a blood thinner when they have so much bloody diarrhea, but it's actually okay. Um, when we then, if the patient's still in hospital, they've been on steroids for three days, it's not improving despite the steroids, that means it's quite acute, then you can switch them to IV cyclosporine or also, you know, those biologics that I talked about, that's also an option. So you can either give them IV cyclosporine or IV infliximab. Um, if they're still not improving, so they're still putting about eight to nine, 10 times a day, then you need to get the surgeons involved. To be honest, when they come to the hospital and they've got severe colitis, you, usually you actually call the surgeons early just to say, you know what, we've got this patient, he's on steroids. Um, he might need surgeons later because the steroids might not work. And the surgeons come in, they see the patient and they just explain to them what the plan is. So what you see, because the um, inflammation is throughout the colon, and it never extends beyond the ileocecal valve, you can actually just take the whole colon out and treat them and that's it. They'll never have to deal with it again. So it's actually a treatment option for patients. They obviously don't want that because you end up with a stoma, which is the picture that you see there um, for the rest of your life usually. Um, however, there's also a type of surgery that you can have where you can actually connect um, that bit of the ileum in with the rectum, it's a thing. Um, and you can actually just have a full um, colon again, but that's beyond this topic. So yes, so basically steroids, IV fluids, steroids not working, cyclosporine, biologics not working, surgeons take the colon out, done, stoma. Okay, right. Next. So we've got question five. Let me just look at the time. Oh God, it's seven. Oh, good. No, it is seven. Sorry, we've got half an hour. Good. Question five. We've got a 28-year-old female presents the ED, severe abdominal pain, bloating, and anorexia. She reports one week history of a, an ulcerative colitis flare, passing bloody diarrhea five times a day. However, she has not opened her bowels for the past 24 hours. Okay, that's very important. Um, OBS include a temperature of 38.8, heart rate 126, blood pressure is 97 over 58. On examination, she's got a dry mucous membranes, decreased skin trigger, and her abdomen is distended with generalized tenderness to palpation. Her venous blood gas shows a pH of 7.39, hemoglobin of 95, and a lactate of 3.6. So you can see the normal ranges. So which of the following investigation is most likely to confirm the diagnosis? A, FBC, B, use and ease, C, abdominal x-ray, a D, colonoscopy, and E, barium enema. So we'll just give you time to read the questions and have a think. Okay, so 47% of you have chosen C, no one's chosen A or B, and 40% have chosen D and E. Okay, so let's go through it. So next slide, the correct answer is an abdominal x-ray. So this is because we're concerned about one important complication that you see in UC, and it's sometimes in Crohn's, um, which is called toxic megacolon. So basically, it's do you know what? Let's go to we'll go to the next page. But let me just look through the question. So she's 28. She's coming with abdominal pain, bloating, and anorexia. She's got one week history of a flare-up, so we know what she's got. But she hasn't opened her bowels in 24 hours. That is not normal. Okay, so that's your first red flag. Someone with bloody diarrhea and a UC flare-up should be opening her bowels a lot. So she's not opened her bowels, so you're already concerned. Um, and she's unwell. So she's got a temperature of 38.8. Her heart rate is 126, and she's hypotensive. She's 28. Her blood pressure is 97 or 58. So you're definitely worried. Um, she's dry, 
Okay, so that means she's very dehydrated. Her abdomen is distended and she's tender. And her hemoglobin is 95. So she's quite, lost quite a lot of blood as well. And her lactate is high. So she's got something wrong with her. And the signs that you're seeing of pointing to her abdomen, so she's got an issue and she's got a complication. So when you see someone like this and it's very unwell with UC, you have to think of toxic megacolon. So if you go to the next slide, we can just go through what that is. So basically, toxic megacolon is this abnormal dilatation that you can see see here um, on the x-ray of a, greater than six centimeters is the definition. Um, it's not, not due to an obstruction, it's directly due to the inflammation. The inflammation has literally caused your colon to di dilate and the risk is that one, you get really unwell with it um, and it might perforate as well and then you know you need to get good, um, have surgery. So it's very important to be aware of the signs. So your temperature is high, you're tachycardic, your neutrophils are high as well and you're anemic and other things include dehydration, altered consciousness, your electrolytes are deranged, and you're hypotensive and your blood pressure is low. So this x-ray has shown a very dilated, um, extensive, extensive dilated uh, colon with what we call lead piping. As you can see, if you see on the, well, on what should be your right side of your screen, but the left side of the patient, you just see this thing. It's just like, a, it looks like a long lead pipe. That's what we call lead piping and just shows that the patient's um, bowel is just fully inflamed. And you can see that there's a loss of the hostile uh, markings on the colon as well. So it doesn't even look like a normal colon. It just looks really odd. Like that is not a normal colon. So it's a very inflamed colon that's dilated. And with her symptoms, she definitely has toxic colon. So you just need to um, get the surgeons involved. And she's probably going to need serial x-rays. You're going to need to treat her with IV fluids, manage her electrolytes, give her some antibiotics and keep a close eye on her because she's very unwell. Okay, great, next one. So we've got question six. So we've got a 56 year old male presents to his GP complaining of fatigue, pruritus, and right upper quadrant pain. He has a past medical history of UC managed with mesalazine. On examination, he has jaundice of the sclera and hepatomegaly. His blood results are shown in the table below. He's referred to gastroenterology and a magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatography or MRCP shows, a, shows multiple beaded biliary structures. So his biliary bin is 21, his ALT is 27, his ALP is 204, and his GGT is 96. Which of the following is the only curative treatment for the most likely diagnosis? So we've got A, liver transplantation, B, balloon dilatation and stenting of the hepatic duct. C, blood spectrum antibiotics, D, cholesteramine, and E, ursodeoxycholic acid. So which is the only curative treatment for whatever this diagnosis is? So we'll just give you a minute to pick a question and then we'll go for it. Okay, so 53% of you have chosen B, 7% have chosen A, 20% have chosen C, and the rest of you have chosen cholesterol or UDCA, fine. Okay, so if I didn't know, so the right answer is liver transplant. If you weren't sure what the right answer is, just remember that it says the only curative treatment. And I suppose... Okay, let's start from the beginning. So it's a 56-year-old gentleman with, a, with, um, with no new C. But now he's jaundiced and he's got wet upper quadrant pain and his MRCP shows multiple beaded biliary structure. So there's a classic um, liver pathology that coexists with UC and it's PSC or primary sclerosis and cholangitis, um, if anyone's heard about it. And basically, like the MRCP shows, the biliary tree starts to get um, bead-like um, dilatation so you get bits so let's imagine this is one of the biliary tracts you start to get that little bits of dilatation and it starts and it looks like a bead 
basically. And because of that, you get a lot of bile stuck in the liver and in the biliary structure, they get jaundice, they get yellowing, um, and it's classic. So patients with UC, if they came in with jaundice, just think PSC in the questions, okay? Um, then, so if you th you're thinking PSC based on the MRCP and the fact that he's got UC and hepatomegaly and jaundice. So when you think about the treatment of, U um, of PSC, it says curative. The only thing that will cure your PSC is to take the liver out. Okay, everything else are things that we can do um, to support patients who have PSC, but it won't cure it. So when they say balloon dilatation and stenting of the hepatic duct, so it's like they've got a lot of strictures in the biliary tree. And sometimes when it, they can't get transplant, what you do is you go in there and you dilate the duct and just kind of relieves the um, issue for a time, but it doesn't treat it. Antibiotics we also give. Again, if you've got these strictures, um, it just means the bile in the liver isn't flowing so well and anti um, bacteria love bile. So basically when you've got these strictures in the liver, you give them antibiotics because it, it, they do get a lot of infection. Cholestyramine helps with the itching and UDCA is a treatment option that we actually use for PSC. So everything you can actually use to treat PSC, um, but the only thing that actually cures PSC is, liver, is a liver transplant. So this, so you can see on the uh, MRCP on your left, you can see just a dilated tree and you might be able to see evidence of the beading as well if you if you kind of do you know what if you just believe <laughs> I can't really point to it unfortunately um but basically what it is is a chronic progressive inflammation and destruction of the extra hepatic and or intrahepatic bile duct so you get inflammation inflammation um produces strictures and then you get jaundice so PSC affects three percent of patients with UC but 70 to 95 percent of patients with PSC have UC Okay, so they present with pruritus, which is itchiness, jaundice, fatigue, right upper quadrant pain, um, hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, and your liver function test. And if you remember when we first talked about UC, it's one of the tests that you do for patients who present with UC. Um, it will show a cholestatic picture, which means that they've got a biliary obstruction somewhere. Then you do an ultrasound, which also show a dilatation, and then the MRCP, like we talked about. So usually you manage them as best as you can until um, they're unwell enough to need a liver transplant, um, or until they fulfill the criteria for the liver transplant, which is the only way you can treat them. Okay. So while we're on talking about other other manifestations of UC, just something to remember: UC can there are extra intestinal features which you just have to learn classic exam questions. So in the picture at the top is something called erythema nodosum. Um, and at the bottom, you get something called pyoderma gangrenosum. That's classic. You can also get it with Crohn's disease as well. Um, other manifestations are anterior uveitis. Um, so issues with the eyes, episcleritis, conjunctivitis. They also get a lot of arthropathy. So you get um, symmetrical arthritis, sacroiliitis, sacri osteoporosis, osteopenia, PSC, like we talked about. Um, and other features of clubbing, amyloidosis, and mouth ulcers. So again, you just have to kind of learn um, about these features. And it's just classic. They come up in the questions a lot. So again, I would just learn them off. So question seven, we've got a 21-year-old who comes to his GP, seven-week history of crampy abdominal pain, tenesmus, non-bloody diarrhea occurring for four to five times a day. He reports fatigue and a 4 kg weight loss over this period. On examination, vital signs are in normal range. He's got an after mouth ulcer noted on the labial mucosa, and there is tenderness in the right lower quadrant on examination. His rectal examination reveals a perianal skin tag, but no palpable internal masses or rectal bleeding. Which of the following investigations is most likely to confirm the diagnosis? A, abdominal x-ray, B, fecal occult blood test, C, fecal calprotectin, D, a pelvic MRI, and E, ileocolonoscopy with biopsies. Okay, so we'll give you a chance to answer. I might cut it down to 45 seconds. I just realized we only have 15 minutes and I wanna get through the last few questions.
Okay, so most of you have chosen E, ileocolonoscopy with biopsies. Fantastic, that's the correct answer. Um, some people have also chosen B um, and the other options. So let's go through the questions. So basically you need to know what the diagnosis is before you figure out what investigation is gonna confirm it. So he's 21, seven week history. So it's probably inflammatory bowel disease. It's not gonna be infective. He's got non-bloody diarrhea, which is key. Um, he's got weight loss. He's got the aptus ulcers as well, but he's also got perianal skin tag. Um, so basically he's got Crohn's disease as evidenced by the fact that he's got non-bloody diarrhea um, and as opposed to um, bloody diarrhea, which is again, classic for UC. So you kind of just confirm, um, you base it, you choose based on that. Note he's also got an aptus ulcer. And again, remember I, I told you that um, you also see this in UC, but it's actually more common in um, Crohn's. But don't let the actress also throw you off, I guess is the most important thing. Um, to investigate and confirm um, the diagnosis of UC, you do it ileocolonoscopy. And that's because unlike UC, um, Crohn's patients can have inflammation throughout, it's classic, throughout the GI tract, but it doesn't have to be continuous. So you can get in the colon, get in the ileum, get it in the esophagus. Like it just, it doesn't matter. They get skip lesions. So it's not continuous, which is why you have to do an ileocolonoscopy and do biopsies as well. And it's important to get to the ileum because um, Crohn's disease loves um, the ileum. I don't know why actually, but it does. So that's something to just remember. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, so that's what will confirm. So the, the, the question was what will confirm your diagnosis? And that's what, so the biopsy will be important and then the visualization with the ileocolonoscopy. So it tends to present with diarrhea like you see, uh, but usually non-bloody. You get abdominal pain, you get perianal disease like the skin tags and the ulcers that we saw. You get weight loss like this gentleman had, lethargy, extra intestinal manifestations like you see and some complications. So you can see what I mean by patchiness of the inflammation. It's not continuous. You get it in different parts of the colon at the same time. It doesn't have to be continuous and you see is continuous. So just Never forget that, okay? Um, unlike you, see, oh, if you go to the next slide as well, please. Thank you so much, Emily. So unlike you see as well, um, remember you see uh, is more superficial. So it affects the mucosa and submucosa. Crohn's disease is transmural. So it affects all the layers of the colon. And this is important uh, where you think of the kind of complications that patients with Crohn's disease get. So because it affects all the layers of the colon, they're more likely to get um, complications like a fistula, which is like you can see here when we talk about, you can get a fistula, which is um, an opening between um, two areas of uh, epithelial lining. So basically just imagine like a hole through the colon um, and it causes a lot. So because it, in, it affects every layer of that, um, of the colon, it, it presents a specific way. So you get fistulas, you get strictures because it affects everything. Okay, so it's, you get strictures. You don't get that in UC, you don't get fistula. Um, you don't get perianal disease as well in um, UC. It's very classic for Crohn's. So your investigations are gonna be full blood count, um, CRP, ESR, using the E's, LFTs, TFTs, pretty much the same thing that you do for um, UC. You do your stool sample as well. You do your investigations like we talked about, um, and you get this cobblestone appearance like you can see, classic. When you hear cobblestone in pink crowns, you get bowel wall thickening. Remember, it affects everything, all the layers. You get the narrowing of the colon itself, again, because it affects everything. So it just constricts. You get deep ulcers. Again, you get the ulcers because it affects all the layer of the colon, and you get the fistula as well. Um, granulomas, if you remember, we talked about that um, in, in the start and you get skip lesions as well. So acutely you want to do an abdominal x-ray and make sure there's no obstruction. Obstruction is a big thing in Crohn's disease. Again, because you get that transmural um, inflammation, it's more likely to constrict. Okay. Other things you can do is CT scan, MRI and barium enema. Okay. I'm going to sweep through the next few questions. So 26 year old, presents to her GP, acute flare of Crohn's, six watery stools a day with abdominal pain and malaise. It's her first flare of Crohn's in 18 months. She's not on any regular medications. Vital signs are normal. Abdomen, abdomen is soft with tenderness in the right lower quadrant and no distension or guardian. What is the next step of treatment for this lady? I'll give you 30 seconds this time and then we can talk to her.
Okay, most of you have chosen C. Some of you have chosen mesalazine, infliximab, and is it therapy? No one's chosen methotrexate. Okay, so the answer is prednisolone. Um, and that's because, well, you know, she's got Crohn's um, and she's passing six watery stools per day. Basically, you want to in, um, induct induce remission so if we go to the next slide we'll talk about how you induce remission in Crohn's similar to so it, it, it's similar to UC but it's also very different so the first line is a steroid that we talked about you can also use bedesonide which is kind of like um it tends to coat the um colon itself and improves the inflammation there's something called entro nutrition that actually works so literally it's just kind of like a powdery milkshake thing that they drink that actually helps the inflammation and asa is actually an option as well um is it hyperin like in uc methotrexate so we use methotrexate in crohn's we don't use it in uc and biologics we also use in crohn's again if you're um not responding to steroids not responding to the first line then you add on this other ther uh, this other therapy um, once their uh, symptoms have improved, then you need to tell them to stop smoking. Remember, it's a risk factor. You give them some azathioprine, methotrexate, and myologics for maintaining the remission. Surgery is different in Crohn's. Like I said, Crohn's tends to happen in the colon, in the ileum, it moves around. So if you took out the old colon, you're not going to treat the Crohn's because it could just happen in the small bowel again. Okay, so it's not like um, you see where you take out the colon and that's it all sorted. So usually you tend to treat them based on what symptoms they have. So if they've got obstruction, you just kind of chop out a little bit and resect it and then you join it together usually. But you try not to do that because you can end up chopping quite a bit of the colon and then you run into quite a lot of trouble. So you use surgery if it's localized disease or you're not responding to uh, medical treatment. And post-surgery, you still have them on treatment again because they can develop Crohn's in any part of the um, bowel, small bowel and um, large bowel. And also they also have, require colonoscopy as well. Okay, next question. Question nine, 56 year old presents to the ED um, with constant throbbing perianal pain, worsened defecation associated with a purulent discharge, past medical history of Crohn's, an examination and vital signs are normal, rectal examination reveals an inflamed opening in the skin surrounding the anus. Which of the following is most likely diagnosis? So hemorrhoids, anal fissure, perianal fistula, entrovesicular fistula, and entrocolic fistula. Great. So you've, most people have chosen perianal fistula. Fantastic. And um, some people have chosen D and B and A. Okay. So the answer is a perianal fistula. It's not hemorrhoids. Based on the examination, it doesn't sound like hemorrhoids. It's just an opening in the skin. Anal fissure would be a more of a pain, painful, um, I guess, fissure really, and it wouldn't discharge. So perianal fistula is more likely. It's something that you see. You got the perianal pain, and it's discharging. Um, um, a purulent uh, substance. It was entrovesicular, which means it's probably a fistula from the colon into the bladder. Um, you, you wouldn't expect um, a purulent discharge. You'd probably expect uh, some urine. An entrocolic fistula, you'd expect, expect some stool. And that's fine. We can go to the next, next slide. So complications of Crohn's. Remember, transmural inflammation. So you get strictures, fistulas, because it affects through the whole layer of the colon. Perianal disease. Um, and then you can get um, perforation, dilatation, and significant hemorrhage as well, especially if the inflammation goes in and affects, um, they get inflammation through the um, four layers and then um, it hits a vessel as well. And um, you can get anemia, severe malnutrition because they're just not absorbing, and again, risk of cancer, okay? And then this is just um, a picture showing tracts of uh, fistula as well and things like that, okay. Other extra intestinal features of Crohn's, again, it tends to overlap with you see. So erythema nodosum, pyodema, gangrenosum, you can get psoriasis, you can get the ocular um, manifestations as well. Um, PSC, but not as much as you see, and you can get amyloidosis and renal stones as well. Okay, and that's a picture of an afters ulcer, by the way, um, since we've talked about it so much. 
Great. And so, oh, I think this is, that was actually the final question. So important take home message is differentiating between UC and Crohn's disease. And it's very important because they're managed very differently as we've talked about. So risk factors, again, we've talked about smoking and whether or not they have an appendectomy, that's very important. Their symptoms, bloody diarrhea, not bloody diarrhea, left side pain, right side pain, perianal disease, not perianal disease, okay? Um, and macroscopic changes are very important and you're gonna get questions like that. So you get discontinuous information, like I've talked about for like 10 times, I do apologize, but it's so important, okay? So they don't get continuous inflammation in Crohn's. So from mouth to anus, you can get it anywhere at any point, okay? It doesn't have to be continuous and they get skip lesions as well, which means they can have it at one point and then not have it and it can be normal and then Crohn's and then normal along the colon. And um, this is as compared to UC where it's just a continuous inflammation, starts at the rectum and then goes up. Okay, so that's UC. Um, so the rectum's always involved in UC and in Crohn's, the ileum is usually involved, hence the ileocecal um, colonoscopy that we do. Um, so on histology, um, on Crohn's disease, you expect to see inflammation throughout the four layers from mucosa to serosa. You expect to see goblet cells and granulomas. And in UC, you expect um, inflammation infiltrate in lamina propria, you get crypt abscesses, and it's just the mucosa and submucosa. It does not penetrate um, further. Then extra intestinal features to know about gallstones and renal stones, uh, classic for Crohn's, and then in PSC is classic for UC. So any patient who comes in with jaundice and deranged liver function tests with a background history of ulcerative colitis do think PSC. I think that's last slide. Great. And we made it. Do you have any questions? Please, please feel free to um, put some questions in the chat at any point. Um, but I think, and if not, thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate your um, interaction.